Test one, two, test one, two. Test one two, test one two, check, check, check. Test one two. 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 Check, 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 check.
Welcome to another worship service here at Bible Baptist Church. So glad that you are here. And uh, we join in with what the psalmist said. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's not because of the building, not even the people were the most important thing. But the fact that the building represented the presence of God. And so he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And so even to pause and think right now, right now we meet that equation and he is with us here. He is right here in the midst of the worship service. And so all that we say, all that we do, our behavior, everything is for his honor his glory, and for his praise. I would also like to welcome our family and guests that are joining us via live stream today. Welcome. So glad that you're here. We have several announcements, and so we want to get right into it. And first, we have an announcement from our medical ministry. And so we have uh, Dr. Kathy is going to come give us an announcement. Good morning, Bible Baptist family and friends. Thank you, Pastor, for giving way yet to another regular announcement of ours. As Pastor said, I'm Kathy Jackson. I'm a member of the medical ministry, and that's under the leadership of uh, Brother Jake Holloway. I thought I saw him over there, yes, and then Dr. Sylvia Hicks-Fox. Our committee continues to meet regularly, and we have done so throughout the whole pandemic. And we are doing so to review information that's going on in the community regarding this virus, as well as coming back to you with highlights. Important pieces of information we feel can be helpful as we continue to navigate through this pandemic. I believe the last time I was here, it was early January, and at that time, the concern was the surge with the Omicron variant. So you may be asking, well, if I'm up here, is there another variant? Yes, there's probably another variant. No, we don't have another surge as of yet. But that doesn't mean that we need to stop or lower our, um, our concern for what we need to do regarding this. So instead of reacting to the next variant, we want to remind and encourage you to be vi vigilant and prepared. As you may recall, there were five points that we discussed during that previous announcement. One is hand washing, and you want to first and foremost do water and soap, but if that's not available, then you use the hand sanitizer. Proper mask wearing, and um, I'm wearing this as I'm making this announcement, one, because other people are coming up after, but also it is not as hard as we sometimes make it out to be to communicate with this on. Um, so just keep that in mind, and this is the uh, KN95, the N95s are very tight, but at, um, obviously add more protection. Three, um, recognizing, and this one's important, recognizing and paying attention to the symptoms that you may be having and remaining home from work, school, and church when you do have any of these symptoms. And that's just not with the coronavirus. We should be doing that with flus or RSV when our kids are sick or common cold viruses as well. Four, the rapid use, or the use of the rapid testing, and five, getting vaccinated if able. No new points, because of, these are the ones that work, you know, so um, we also want to couple this with good rest and good diet. Our strategy is still the same. No need to fix it, because it works. What I do want to add is if you have not gotten a home test, the rapid home test, you can go to the stores if they're not available. And there was also that option to get it through the mail, covidtests.gov. Um, some people were able to get N95 or, or N95 masks at some of the stores. Um, or you can call your local community centers or senior centers. They're passing them out there as well. Again, the medical ministry urges us all to stay the course for ourselves and our loved ones and our community. And thank you for your listening ear. Amen. Thank you so much. Our next announcement is from the marriage ministry. Deacon and Sister Gibson. Thank you. 
Good morning, Bible Baptists. Good morning. <clears throat> Kathy said we should keep our mask on, so we're going to give it a try. Coming to you on behalf of the marriage ministry uh, this morning. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 4 and 5 says, Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. The marriage ministry uh, held a togetherness challenge for the first 14 days of February. The goal of the challenge was to do something signifying your love for your spouse each day. The couples with the most completed challenges uh, will win. Hopefully the couples were able to start new habits that will continue from this point on. There's nothing more gratifying to couples than when both husbands and wives edify their marriages. And this is very important, so we'll, we'll move on at this point. And of course, we'd like to thank everyone who, who participated, but we'd like to now um, present prizes to those couples who, who completed the most challenges. We're not going to um, uh, present them in order of the number, but in alphabetical order. And as we call your name, if you'll please come forward. Both of you. Brother Clarence and Sister Patricia Atkins. Brother Byron and Sister Nancy Foster. And we are very confident that all couples would be here. Uh, and that said, uh, we have to be sure. I said, you know Terry and me are going to be there. So our next one is for Brother Terry and Sister Mia Jones. Uh, and they're not here this morning. I don't think. I don't see um, them. So we'll, we'll prayerfully get their gift delivered to them. Okay. Let's give another round of applause, please. And just as a reminder, for those married couples who are interested in the Weekend Remember Conference that's coming up in April 22nd, there is still time to register. And if you register soon enough, there's still opportunity for significant savings on that registration. So see one of us or any couple on the marriage committee and keep your eye on the email for announcements. Thank you. Just one additional announcement this morning that those parents that are bringing your children to the children's ministry on Sunday morning, um, please enter the sanctuary doors. We're going to keep the butler side doors locked for security. So those parents who are bringing your children to the Sunday morning children's ministry, use the sanctuary doors instead of the butler side doors. At this time, Deacon Herbert is going to come. And lead us, lift every voice and sing. Let us all stand.
setting our path through the blood of the slaughter out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star May we bow our head for a word of prayer. Our Father, Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you once again, Lord, for a day that we have never seen before and truly a day that we will never see again. Thank you for our life, our health, our strength, and the use and activities of our limbs. We thank you, Lord, for your setting word that through you we live, we move, and have our being, and your grace is sufficient for us. Lord, we also come thanking you for your mercy. We thank you for your righteousness. Lord, we thank you for being loving. Lord, we thank you for being forgiven. Lord, we thank you for you just being God and God all by yourself. For you rule and you super rule and you got all power in your hands. Lord, we just want to say thank you. Lord, we thank you for last night's laying down and this morning rising up. We thank you for putting clothes on our backs and shoes on our feet and giving us a house to come out to your house of worship just one more time. To sing Zion songs and to praise your holy and righteous name, knowing that your name alone is worthy to be praised. Lord, we thank you for being a protector. Lord, we thank you for being our guide. Lord, we thank you for being a leader. We thank you for being a way out of no way. We thank you for being a shelter in a time of storm. Lord, we thank you for being a father and mother, Lord, when we didn't have one. Lord, we thank you for being a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Lord, we thankful, Lord, that you was always there to see about us. Lord, you said that we call upon you, Lord, that you will hear us and you will answer us. And you will show us great and mighty things which thou hast not known. So, Lord, we come to you. Lord, thank you for just being so good. Even when we were not so good, Lord, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, Lord, we just want to say thank you. We want to thank you, Lord, even when things don't seem that they are going so good. 
but you said in your word, Lord, that we should give thanks. Well, this is the will of God concerning us in Christ Jesus. Lord, you said in your word, Lord, that all things work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So that's why we will bless the Lord at all times. And our praises, or your praises, shall continually be in our mouth. Our soul shall make a boast to the Lord, and the utmost shall hear thereof. You said in your word to, oh, magnify the Lord with me, and we will exalt your name together. For you are good. So, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we come to you with a bowed down head and a heavy heart, asking you to have mercy on our much needed souls. Lord, we come to you as an empty pitcher before an ever flowing fountain. Lord, asking you to fill us up with your love, to fill us up with your joy, to fill us up with your peace. Lord, we come confessing our sins of thought and sins of deed, realizing that you said in your word, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to forgive ourselves, Lord. Things that we have done in the past, things that we have said, Lord, you said you will throw those things in the sea of forgetfulness and you will not remember them no more. Help us to press toward the mark of the high calling, Heavenly Father. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this church at large. Lord, help us to love each other. Help us to check up on one another. Help us to build one another up. That if there is a need, Lord, that it may be met, Lord, even now. Lord, we thank you for all of the leaders, Lord. We thank you for this city, this state, Lord, this nation, Heavenly Father. It seems like we need your help more than ever. It seems like we are more divided more than ever, Heavenly Father. So, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you may bring peace, Lord. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you may even give peace to our minds, Lord, that passes all of our understanding and keeps our hearts and minds through you in Christ Jesus. Lord, there may be some families in trouble right now. There may be some marriages in trouble right now, Lord. Lord, we pray for the spirit of reconciliation, Lord, that you may bring them back together to one. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, the one who hung, bled, and died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. You were buried, and you rose again on the third day morning with all power. Heaven and earth is in your hands. Lord, we come praying for our pastor, Lavender, and his family. Continue to strengthen him when he is weak. Build him up when he is torn down. Prop him up on every leaning side. For you said in your word that I will give thee pastors according to your heart that will feed us with knowledge and with understanding. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that anybody who doesn't know you in a free pardon of their sins. May they confess you as Lord and Savior, Lord, and to seek your face and turn from their wicked ways. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We be careful to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Thank God. song we're going to sing, it's an old song. We've sang it before when our kids were little. We used to sing this song. It's called Traveling Shoes. It's a, kind of like a black history, our American history type song. And for me, it's been a challenge uh, because your walk is your conduct. And then the question came, comes to me, how are you walking? How are you doing in your conduct, in your self-life? This is a lifelong challenge. And then the, the other thought behind this song is heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. So this song, if you listen closely, you'll hear it speaking to everybody challenging them to this fact.
Oh, death come riding at the gambler's door. He said, oh, gambler, are you ready to go? Tell me that gambler looked down and he said, no, 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 no I, I can't go. Ain't got all my traveling shoes, ain't done my duty, said no, no, no. I can't get on board because I ain't got all my traveling shoes. Death come a-riding at the drunkard's door. He said, oh, drunkard, are you ready to go? Tell me that drunkard looked down and he said, no, 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 I can't go. Ain't got on my traveling shoes, ain't done my duty, said no, no, no. I can't get on board because I ain't got on my traveling shoes. Death come a riding at the drunkard's door. He said, oh, drunkard, are you ready to go? Tell me that drunkard looked down and he said, no, 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 I can't go. I ain't got on my traveling shoes, ain't done my duty, said no, no, no. I can't get on board because I ain't got on my traveling shoes. Death come a riding at the liar's door. He said, oh, liar, are you ready to go? Tell me that liar looked down and he said, no, 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 I can't go. Ain't got on my traveling shoes, ain't done my duty, said no, no, no. I can't get on board because I ain't got on my traveling shoes. Death come a riding at the Christian's door. Well, he said, oh, Christian, are you ready to go? Tell me that Christian just smiled and he said, yes, yes, yes. I'm ready to ride. I have done my duty and I am satisfied, so let me get on board. I'm ready to go. I just got on my traveling shoes. Yes, yes, yes. I'm ready to ride. I have done my duty and I am satisfied, so let me get on board. I'm ready to go. Just got on my traveling shoes. Amen. Thank you, Phillips family. Wow. Tremendous harmony. Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. And I want to address the parable of the nobleman. Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. And for the next three hours, so good to have Terrence. I didn't think we were going to see Terrence. We've been praying for him. God answered prayer. Injury, Consuela's back, so good, and loss of her mom, we've been praying, and just looking around, seeing people we've been praying for, God answers prayer, amen, God answers prayer, so good to see you. Gospel of Luke chapter 19, I'm going to read verse 11, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. And because they had thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. 
This is another parable, and I think it's fitting to, again, look at the meaning of what a parable is. A parable simply means to compare. And uh, the comparison is a story, an allegory that has a representation in life for the purpose of teaching a moral or spiritual lesson. So anytime you open your Bibles and you see parable, you know there's going to be a comparison. The comparison is going to be an allegory or story that has a representation in life, a real life situation, and the purpose is always for moral, spiritual instruction or learning. This particular parable also has a purpose in verse 11, and the purpose is their thoughts, the disciples' thoughts, the, the multitude's thoughts as it regards the kingdom of God. Verse 11, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Just like their thoughts, your thoughts, my thoughts are often directed towards the kingdom of God and what it is and when will it happen. Generally, I'm thinking about the Lord's coming in his kingdom when I'm hearing about pestilence or diseases, when I'm hearing about wars and rumors of wars, and also when I'm thinking or hearing about famine or the potential of famine in the land. Those three things, famine, war, and pestilence generally make us begin to think about, they, they give us a life pause so that we can start thinking about the coming of the Lord and therefore the kingdom of God. And so he says that their thoughts were about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is the realm where the rule of God is manifested. The kingdom of God is the realm where the rule of God is manifested, that is, where his will is being done. And of course, in the prophetic setting that once rebellion and disobedience, or what we call the time of the Gentiles, comes to an end, then God will manifest his kingdom upon earth. We are reminded of that in that prayer when the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And in that prayer, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so when the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled and the Lord Jesus Christ comes to establish his kingdom upon earth, then that will be realized and the first phase of the kingdom of God, the 1,000 years on earth and then the eternal aspects of the kingdom of God in the eternal new heaven and the new earth. But the time of that, no one knows the day, no one knows the hour or the timing of that kingdom when it comes. And so when the disciples are asking Jesus in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of Luke about the kingdom, he says that it is the kingdom that is already within you. The kingdom of God is already in your hearts. That is that the heart of the kingdom, all the kingdom aspects, those things that will be done, the will of God can be manifested now. The obedience of God, the service of God, the stewardship of God, and the message of the kingdom can be realized now, he says, within you and in your hearts. And so the parable is given because their thoughts 
were regarding the kingdom of God, just like your thoughts and my thoughts are often thinking about this matter of the kingdom. And so Jesus then is going to give a parable, a story, an allegory to represent then what is a realization in life. What should I be doing? What should be my heart's condition in light of the coming kingdom of God? And so he begins to tell this parable of the nobleman. The first thing we see is this journey of the nobleman. In verse 12 he says, He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. The word nobleman is an elevated person, a person who is dignified, one who is ranked above any commoner. Again, a nobleman is a dignified person, a person who is elevated in dignity, a person who is elevated above commoner or the rest of humanity. Notice that in this story, this nobleman, this person of high rank, this elevated person is going into a country and the goal is to go into the country to be able to receive the kingdom and then once he receives the kingdom, the promise is that the nobleman will return. I think it's important for us to consider this parable because it is obvious that the parable and the story is a representation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who has gone away and in his going away he is going for a specific reason to be able to receive the kingdom of God and then the promise is that he will return. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13, a conversation begins between Peter, who represents the other disciples, and Jesus is beginning to talk about the glorification, that I am glorified in the Father, the Father is glorified in me, and we are glorified together. In the incarnation, that glory was veiled, similarly to the veil that was put on Moses' face when he went into the holies of holies and the glory Shekinah cloud did shine so much that Moses had to veil his face. Jesus, who is God, coming and taking on humanity, veiled that glory and uh, he begins to pray about the return in fact, in his prayer in John 17, he says, Father, glorify me with thyself with the glory that we had before the world was. And so he tells Peter and the disciples, I'm going away, and where I go, ye cannot follow me. And then he says, I'm going away. And you can't follow me now. And then he says in chapter 14, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. The Bible says, and then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority. So this nobleman in the story, he says, I'm going away, and I'm going into a far, far country, and I'm going to receive the kingdom, and then I'm going to return. This nobleman in the story is a representation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 
who will return once all the enemies are under his footstool, when all the enemies have been defeated, and then he'll usher in the kingdom of God. The next thing that we need to see in this story is not only the noblemen, but also the servants. The servants of the narrative, the servants of the parable. Verse 12, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, occupy until I come. What is a servant? A servant is someone who humbly, voluntarily serves someone else. A servant is somebody who humbles themselves and voluntarily serves someone else. It is these servants of the kingdom that the nobleman, as he goes away to the far country to get the kingdom and then return, while I'm gone, I'm going to give you 10 pounds. All of my 10 servants, I'm going to give each of you a pound. One pound, 10 pounds, one pound for each of the servants. And what I want you to do is, I want you to occupy until I come. A pound is a weight of measurement for money. One pound is the equivalent of a hundred shekels of silver in the scriptures. You think about silver today, right now, today, or at least yesterday, silver was $32 for an ounce of silver. $32 for an ounce of silver, just to give us somewhat of an idea of this nobleman entrusting his servants with a pound. This is considered stewardship, that I'm going away, I'm taking what I have, and I'm entrusting it with you. And what I want you to do is I want you to take this pound that I'm giving to you and I want you to occupy until I come. 1828 Webster's Dictionary says that the word occupy in the text simply means to get busy or to do business or to negotiate with the pound that had been left to them. He says, now I want you to occupy, I want you to be busy, I want you to negotiate, I want you to do business for me, I want you to employ until I come. Occupy until I come. You and I are the servants of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We serve him, we are his disciples, we are his followers. And as he left and he rose again from the dead, he ascended up. And the apostle Paul says that, that, that when he ascended, one of the things he did, he left gifts unto men. He gave gifts unto men. The gifts that are given to the church, both men and women, these gifts that are given are for the purpose of doing ministry. He said he gave some apostles and prophets and he gave pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints to do the work of the ministry. And each and every one of us has at least one gift that Jesus has given to us for the purpose of occupying, getting busy with it until he returns. One of the things that I have to be careful of when I think about occupying, 
getting busy with what he has given to me and what he has left for me is that when I'm thinking about his going away, that I don't find myself in a position as the first disciples when they actually saw him go away. You see, I can easily find myself, instead of occupying, I find myself gazing. I'm gazing. They heard him say, I'll be back. They saw him leave. And they stood there gazing. And the angel said, why are you gazing? The same Jesus is going to come again in like manner as you saw him go. Don't stand here gazing for that promise. He wants us to occupy. He wants the servants to be good stewards of what he has given to us and what he has left for us. But not only do we see in this parable the servants of the kingdom, but we also see the citizens of the kingdom. In verse 14, but the citizens hated him. And they sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. See, these citizens of the kingdom get the benefits of the kingdom, but they hate the noblemen. These citizens of the kingdom, they get the benefits of the kingdom, but they are simply rejecting the authority of the noblemen. We hate him so much that we don't want this man ruling over us. They were reluctant about submitting to the will of this sovereign ruler. I believe this parable speaks to the majority of humanity today. We are seeing this whole movement of, as David in the Psalm 2, is that when I consider Christ, that I want to cut the courts. I don't want any bonds connected to him. Let's cut the courts. Let's cut all of the bounds that he has left for us. We don't want him ruling over us. When I think about John's gospel chapter one where here the creator is in the world. John says he was in the world. The world was made by him. And the world didn't know him. He came unto his own people. And his own received him not. He says, but as many as do receive him. To them gave he power. To become the children of God. But even for those who are children. We have to think about this idea of him ruling and reigning in our subjection and our submission to him. Because sometimes we want to be children of the kingdom but we don't want him to be Lord of the house. And so Jesus even says in Luke's gospel chapter 6 and verse 46. And why call ye me Lord and do not the things which I say? In other words, you call me Lord, but you're not doing lordship stuff. I am your Lord, you call me the Lord, but you're not doing what I ask you to do. And so I have to be careful of being and having the attitude of the citizens of the kingdom who are having all the benefits of the kingdom, all the benefits of the nobleman, but they hate him. And the words simply speak of their 
total rejection of his authority in their life, we will not have this man rule over us. Isn't this what we're seeing in the culture today? This idea of enlightenment, that we are now enlightened now. That we don't need God anymore. Isn't this what humanism is, that, that we can move along without God? Isn't this what evolution is, that all of this has come into being Without God, this whole spirit of progressiveness and wokeness is all about, you see, we don't need God anymore. We won't have him rule over us. We are the intelligentsia. And we're so smart, we don't need God. We're going to work this out ourselves, you see. We're going to figure it all out. We don't want his rule over us. The sixth thing that we see here is this nobleman returns. <laughs> Verse 14 and 15, but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called. You see, the nobleman returns. According to verse 12, he says, and it's all a promise. I'm going away to a far country. I'm going to get the kingdom. And then I'm going to return. He tells them in verse 13, occupy until I come. All this is is simply a promise that is made. We live in a culture where there's so many broken promises. So many promises that are not kept. Marital promises, parental promises, political promises that are not kept, business promises, financial promises that are not kept. I realize that what you and I are banking on is only a promise that God has made to us, that I will return one day. I will return. It is only a, a promise, and not only is it just a promise, it is a 2,000-year-old promise. 2,000 years old. Peter in, 90, in, in just short of 90 AD says that, that, that there's going to come a time about this promise where there's going to be scoffers who are going to come to the church and they're going to make mockery. They're going to make fun of the promise. Can't believe that you all are still holding on to this promise. Can't believe y'all still waiting on Jesus to come back. Can't believe y'all holding on to that. Can't believe your hope and your, your, your trust is in a promise that, that he said, one day I'm coming back. Don't you know it's been 2,000 years? Peter, who heard that promise of Jesus, Peter led the conversation in the promise. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Peter heard that. And Peter addresses it in his epistle, where he says, of this they ignorantly are in their understanding. Don't they realize that the Lord is not slack? As some men count slackness. 
Don't they know that the very promise that he made to come back 2,000 years, this promise, he says, is the same word that was given in creation when he called the earth out of the water. Let the dry land appear. Did that work or did it not work? Yes, it did. That was the word of God. And then the same word that called the earth out of the water is the same word that put the earth back in the water during the time of the flood. The same word that said, I will keep my promise. I will never again flood the earth again with water. Never again. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put my bow in the sky. And every time you see that bow, I'm looking at it when you look at it. It is simply a sign of my covenant of promise. You can't plan it, can you? You can't say, you know what, I want to go outside and see a rainbow. But you know, you all, sometimes you almost have an accident. You say, man, you see that? Look at that. And there it is. It appeared. God said, every time you see it, remember when you see it, I see it. I'm looking at it. It's simply a sign that I keep my promises. So the promise that we're waiting on, that the, that the Lord would return, he will return as he said. He says that you and I, we have hope in this promise. We trust in this promise. We believe it. This nobleman returns. He returns for reckoning. He returns for an accounting. When I left, I gave all my servants, 10 of you, a pound. I told you to do business for me until... I come. And so now he has obtained the kingdom. He is now returning to the servants. Verse 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful, in a little, very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. There will be and there was a day of accountability. Stewardship simply says that I am managing what someone else owns. These stewards then have to now give accountability. There is a time of reckoning to see what did you do with what I gave you. So the first servant, one pound, made ten pounds. Second one, one pound, five pounds. Third servant came, here it is. I kept it in a nap. The reason why I kept it in a napkin, because I knew your character, you were austere. You were rigid. You don't have a lot of room in your thinking. So you, you, you simply are the kind of person, you take what you didn't lay down. You simply uh, reap what you didn't sow. I mean, you, Lord, you don't have to ask 
It belongs to you. So I, I simply was at a point where I feared your, your character. And because of that, you see, I took the pound and I hid it. I, I put it in a napkin. You said, well, if you felt that way, you could have at least put it in the bank. Kept it there. And at least it would have gained some interest where you would have produced something of the gift that I had given to you. I want us to understand the purpose of this whole accountability and authority that God simply has as the Lord of the house, the Lord of the manor, the Lord of the world, he has taken his servants, you and I, and he has entrusted us with gifts. And uh, this Lord has entrusted us, and uh, one day he will come back, and when he comes back, it will only be about, now this is not salvation. This is not a work salvation. What this is, what did we do with what he gave to us? You see, we have to remember that to whom much is given, much is required. And we are the most blessed people on the face of the earth. God has given each of us a gift of the Holy Spirit. At least one, some have others. God has given us the gift of salvation. God has simply blessed us with wealth. We have more than, we throw away more than most countries do. And when the nobleman, when Jesus comes back, it's going to be all about in the day of reckoning, you see, what did you do with what I gave to you? Did you take what I gave you and did you get busy with it? I'm going to say get jiggy with it, but that's not what it says. It said get busy. Did you get busy with it? Did you, what did you do with it? Did you occupy? Or did you take what I gave you and for your whole Christian life, all you did was stand there gazing, waiting for the promise to be fulfilled? Or did you occupy? Did you get busy with it? Did you utilize it? What ministry did you do? What people did you impact? What produce, what fruit came out of it? Because I want you to know, when he returns with the kingdom, the kingdom will be spiritual, but it will also be political. And so you took ten, you took one pound, you produced ten. You took one, you produced five. Guess what? You have shown me that you can take a little bit that I gave you and you can be faithful with it. So I'm going to give you ten cities in my kingdom. I'm going to give you five cities in my kingdom. Do you not know that what we do now and the faithfulness of what we do now while we're waiting for the kingdom to come will determine what we're going to be doing in the kingdom? Now, we have salvation in Jesus. But the time has come. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know that we're getting closer and it is time for the church to stop gazing and to start occupying, getting busy with what he has given me, what he has given you, what he has given you. You each have at least one gift, but I have to ask myself, what am I doing with it? Am I sitting gazing? Have I gotten comfortable with the fact that he's gone? Don't I realize that one day he will return? 
And he's going to have all of his stewards stand before him. What did you do? Was what I gave you. And it won't be the same. Because some people can take one and produce ten. Some people can take one and produce five. But notice, the one who did ten, the one who did five, they both were considered faithful. Even the man who gave the one back, if you had put it in the bank, which simply shows you got busy with it, that you simply could have at least made a little interest on it. You too would have been faithful. But no, that's not what you did. My kingdom responsibility will be based upon what I do now and am I faithful? I ask myself, pastoring is a gift. It's a gift that God gives me. What am I doing with it? Am I faithful? That's what I ask myself. What is your gift? And then what about the talents? What about the acquired talents? What about all of the the, 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 the talents that have come naturally, everything that God has given to us, what are we doing with it? I'm understanding this more and more, and that's why it's no longer okay for, for us to be blessed with 13 acres and simply say, we got 13 acres. Wow, look at that. What are we doing with it? We got this beautiful building, all these classrooms. What are we doing with it? Are we simply occupying? Or are we just gazing by, man, that's a nice piece of land. Man. Or should we be occupying it? It's no longer okay just to have it sit and do nothing. God is going to ask you, your house your, whatever he has given, what did you do with it? Because remember, I don't own a thing. I'm only a steward of what he owns. And sometimes I ask, why doesn't God give me more? Because I'm not faithful with the little bit. He says, you've been faithful with a little. I'm going to trust you. With more. As I think about the coming kingdom of God, take what He has given, occupy for the kingdom of God. Let's get into kingdom business now. As we anticipate His coming, He says, It's already in you, it's already in your heart. We just have to get busy. May God help you and help me. Thank God for the parable of the nobleman. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. The listeners were concerned about when the kingdom would come. My Lord Jesus spoke a parable. This nobleman going away to a far country, receiving the kingdom and then return. Our Lord Jesus Christ has gone away. And once all the enemies are under his feet, once this time of the Gentiles has come to an end, then he will be, have delivered up the kingdom of God. But he says, while I'm gone, I'm going to bless you and give you gifts. I'll give you a pound. I want you to take it and I want you to be fruitful. I want you to produce with it. When he returned, he, it was a day of reckoning. 
I'm thankful, Father, that we are not in a works salvation. But because we are saved, we don't have to work for it, but we have to work it out. Faith without works is dead. And what do you simply want from us? You've, you, you've given us gifts according to your will. You have delivered to, to every person severally as you will in the church. But there'll be one day when you return, we stand before you, not for salvation, but it'll be about rewards and loss of rewards. You've told us through the parable that the question is, what, what did you do with what I gave you? We don't own a thing. I don't own anything. It all belongs to you. And yet you've entrusted me as a steward. And so I'm asking you to help the preacher. Help me, Father, to be a better steward of what you have given to me. Help my wife, my children, my grandchildren. Help my brothers and sisters here. My family and friends that are viewing via live stream, help us, Lord, to stop and think about this. This whole period that we've gone through has caused us to, to just be in gazing mode. We, we're just gazing. And yet you've asked us to occupy, to get busy. Every man according to what he can do. Whether it's producing one or two or five or ten. You call those servants faithful. 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 And so help me, help us, help Bible Baptist Church to get busy. To occupy. You're coming one day. Could be today. It could be tomorrow. But let me take each day. What, what did I do today? Today. How did I utilize what you gave me? Now there may be someone someone who doesn't know you. You say, heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. So there may be one here. There may be one watching that has never, ever come to a place where they simply believe that you died, that you were buried, you rose again the third day. Your word says that it is with the heart that man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made. And so save that soul that's searching for you today, O oh Lord. There may be someone here today. They're already saved, and yet they're not a part of a church family. If you're here today, would like to come, be a part of Bible Baptist, we'd sure love to have you. Or maybe you're someone who's just standing in the need of prayer. So I need prayer. I heard the word today, I need help, I need prayer. And you want to come, we invite you to come. Let's all stand, let's sing He is Lord.
sing. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Once again. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well, pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the people of God said, amen, amen. God bless you.